Mr. Secretary, good to see you. A few words, good afternoon, a few words of introduction of our uh, distinguished guest before we start. I am Evan Smith, the Editor-in-Chief and CEO of the Texas Tribune. I am very pleased to be joined on stage by the Honorable Rod Page, the former United States Secretary of Education, appointed the nation's top educator by George W. Bush at the start of his first term. Secretary Page served all the way through 2005 for the entire first term of the Bush administration, during which time he spearheaded implementation of the No Child Left Behind Act. Previously, before going into the Bush administration, he served as superintendent of the Houston Independent School District, then the nation's seventh largest school district, and was recognized uh, during that time as the National Superintendent of the Year by the American Association of School Administrators. Before that, he served as dean of the College of Education of Texas Southern University. A native of Mississippi, Secretary Page has a bachelor's degree from Jackson State University and both a master's degree and a doctor of physical education from Indiana University. He's the author in 2010 of The Black-White Achievement Gap, Why Closing It is the Greatest Civil Rights Issue of Our Time. Again, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Rod Page. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, let me jump off uh, of the mention of that book into this conversation today, which more broadly is about <laughs> education as a civil rights uh, issue. You yeah. were writing specifically about the gap between African-American students and yes. white students. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. The, talk about what inspired you to write that book and what your conclusion was about the nature of the gap and the consequences of the gap. When I met with President Bush as president-elect, he talked about some of his goals, what he inspired to do. And one of the things he wanted to do was uh, have some impacts on achievement gap. And the uh, result of that, for, obviously, was the No Child Left Behind Act. Right. If you look at the cover of the bill of the No Child Left Behind Act today, the, there are these words, an act to close the achievement gap with accountability, flexibility, and choice. Yes. And I was very inspired about that goal. Uh, and we began working on that uh, in a very strong bipartisan way. Uh, but as we progressed, there were those who thought it was not a very good idea and began to push back against it. And uh, that kind of gave me the inspiration to, to write the book, The Black White Achievement Gap, yeah. why it is the greatest, closing it is our biggest goal. We need to do that. Yeah. There's no civil rights strategy that would be more powerful and have the stronger leverage in changing right the situation than closing the achievement gap. Is your sense that the No Child Left Behind Act, which of course we've now ro rolled forward from, mm -hmm. controversial current administration, not so enamored of it, is it your sense that that worked to achieve some of the goals that you all, uh, you and well, President Well, obviously we would like to have had a better performance than what has happened, but uh, I think that there has been some strong impact, especially in the earlier grades. Talk about that. Well, the reading and writing, and not so much writing, and, not, and much more math, in early grades uh, has, has improved considerably, especially yeah. with low-income students and minority students. Right. We've had much more challenges uh, in the upper grades. Yeah. The, 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 the nature of the African-American <clears throat> Anglo mm -hmm. gap, let's say, is one thing. In this country, we see population trends moving more in the direction of precipitous growth in the Latino population. Yes. Would you regard the Latino white gap differently than the African American white Absolutely gap? Absolutely not. It's, a, it's the same problem. It, 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 yeah. and it, it, it deserves the same type of emphasis. Right. But of course, as you and I talked about before mm -hmm. we came up here, one difference, maybe there are more differences, is, is that within the Latino Anglo achievement gap, you have baked into it the problems of language. That yes. in a lot of cases where the performance of the Latino student population is off of where it might otherwise be, and if there's a gap between it and the Anglo uh, performance, you've got a problem of, of, uh, of dual language. Or that's right, and that's considerable. Bilingual that's, education. And it is a considerable problem, one right. that has to be worked on quite a bit, but the gap yeah. itself is just the as important. It's the a same. fundamental gap, just as important in that ethnic community as in right. other ethnic communities. And also, we have a gap between our performance and our neighbors, our European and Asian neighbors, especially our Asian neighbors. Which you think should be cause for concern. Absolutely. Because. Well, just remember what happened just recently with the PISA results. Uh, our Secretary of Education now, Secretary Duncan, described yeah. our situation as one of stagnation as far as education is concerned. Yeah. From the results he saw from the right. PISA report. You talk about the No Child Left Behind Act being the emblem of the Bush administration's desire to close the gap. Is this really a problem that can be or should be dealt with at the federal level? 
Is it more of a state level issue? Is it more of a local issue, district by district, community by community? What do you think? I think the responsibility is all along the pipeline. The federal government can have some impact. Yeah. But I think the primary impact has to be at the place where the people walk the halls of the schools and look into the eyes of the children. Right. The major thing that's going to happen in, to, in order to improve it must happen at the classroom level. Yeah. In the classroom is where it happens. And also at home. Right. What, uh, let me come to the parents uh, in a second. So from uh, the standpoint of, of, of school administration, district administration, teachers, what are the things that they should be thinking about? If, if you believe that it, 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 you, you deal with this at the place where you walk those halls, what should they be thinking about from your perspective in terms of addressing this question of the gap? Well, a, effective pedagogy. They should be trying to take the objectives that the state puts out yeah. and convert those objectives into activities that would call children to learn. Yeah. But we know, of course, Mr. Secretary, that at a lot of school, uh, uh, school sites, school districts, there are resources that are an issue, resource challenges. Not every school has the resources to put into in an ideal sense what they'd like to to address in this problem. So in some ways you're asking schools to address a problem where they may not have the tools to address it. Of course, resources are very important. It's a yep. big problem. There are some who have advantages as far as resources are concerned than others. Yep. But uh, in Texas, we are reasonably balanced. We have some challenges now. In fact, we, we got a court case discussing now about the, how finances are distributed. Right. But this is like a, seeing the same movie over and over it here is. in Texas. But it's we, also nobody's looking at something back. else that's just as important as how the resources are used that you do have. Right. Talk about that. And that's what we call productivity. And I think that's a kind of a blind spot in what goes on now in terms of accountability. There's very little emphasis on effective use of the resources that we have. We obviously need more resources, but what good does it do to get more resources if you're not going to use those resources effectively? Right. That's a big problem. So you acknowledge that money is part of the issue, but it's the use money of that money. Money is part of the issue. Use of the money. It is, but it's not the biggest issue. Right. You mentioned parents as having a role in this. I think most people would agree that parents are undeniably going to have a role in, in, in helping to solve this problem. But of course, the schools can't, and education institutionally can't dictate, mandate, or ultimately really impact the behavior of parents. This is a tough, tough situation, but factually we can't get around the point that the, a child who has a loving and caring and supporting parent has a huge advantage. The parent is the most influential person yep. in the life of a child. A child who does not have that support right. is at a serious disadvantage. So when and you, also yeah. creates a problem that the school has to make up for. Right. And this adds more challenges to the teachers and the people inside the school. Yeah. Uh, uh, for a child to be successful in school, they must bring to the env teaching environment certain behaviors, certain beliefs, certain attitudes, certain mindsets that are consistent with learning. Yeah. Absent those, you create a major problem for the teachers and the people in, in the schools. But of course, the circumstances in a lot of the homes where many of the kids who are most at risk in this gap conversation uh, live, right? These, these homes, they're often, it's so, you know, low socioeconomic uh, status, uh, a lot of single parent families, you know, not to generalize, but the reality is that the conditions in these homes can often be their own obstacle to parent participation, parent involvement. And so it's easy to say, well, parents need to be more involved, but often parents are in a very, very tough spot and are not really able to contribute to the degree that you're Absolutely. talking about. And, and uh, of course, poverty is a big issue. Right. But uh, in fact, the OEDC people uh, see poverty accounts for about 15 percent of the variance in the student right. performance. So if you look at two students and they're at that 15 percent right. drop if you're in a lower socioeconomic that's right. And that's a big situation. challenge for us in Texas because right. about 60 60 percent, a little better than 60 percent of our students in Texas uh, are low-income students uh, in right. terms of free and reduced lunch right. eligibility. And of course here in Texas, just to square that circle, we have a, a rapidly growing Latino population, soon to be a majority population, yes. and places in the state of Texas, at least, where that population is growing the fastest and where the composition is changing the most, are often places where a lot of poverty mm -hmm. and low educational achievement. That's, that's true, but you know, it's surprisingly, and maybe it should not be surprisingly, but uh, I see a lot of progress taking place in the south part of Texas. In fact, some years ago, Brownville won the Broad Prize. And I'm one of the 
broad prize juror, so I see the data. Right. And uh, I was surprised at the data that I'm seeing on the southern borders of Texas. Also, Sakura has been uh, among those that were being considered for the Broad's Prize. So, right. so evidently something good is going on there, and, and we need to, to take a look and see what that is. Of course, the question is. is, what is the secret sauce in those districts or in another district down around the border in Texas, the far San Juan Alamo district, whose mm -hmm. superintendent, Danny King, has become kind of a folk hero for his mm -hmm. efforts in turning that district around. But you acknowledge, Mr. Secretary, those are the exceptions. Uh, absolutely. Right. But we should learn from those exceptions. As a matter right. of fact, I, I would like to go and see what he's doing there. Yeah. Let me ask you about the, the, uh, the effort to get kids out of public school, uh, uh, graduation from, from high school. So, you know, a lot of controversy over graduation rates, uh, some sense that states, uh, as hard as it may be to believe, might cook the books or might present statistics in the most flattering light to show that they're doing a good job of, of graduating students. The reality is we know that graduation rates kind of across the board uh, have been a problem. There have been efforts in some states, and Texas is one, to relook at the curriculum in high schools, what the requirements would be, and particularly what, what, what would be necessary for kids to get out. Uh, uh, big discussion here last uh, spring about whether we were taking rigor out of the high school curriculum requirements and possibly moving more kids through the pipeline for the sake of doing so, only to have them hit a wall at the higher ed level where they may need some kind of remediation. Well, first of all, I don't think there's any question about the fact that we were taking rigor out. House Bill 5 Here does, in, Texas, in my view, right. take rigor out. In fact, right. my example would be uh, Algebra 2 is no longer required. Right. And so, uh, and in many institutions of higher learning, right. uh, great universities require students to have Algebra 2. How much so sense so our there? great legislature here in the state of Texas that changed these rules that change, you, you oppose the legislature in Texas making that decision. Well, the whole argument about accountability. Uh, yeah probably need some more discussion. And I'd be a participant in a discussion that would say that maybe we can kind of retrench a little bit, yeah. but I think that we went much too far in backing up of accountability. I think that we set ourselves back considerably. Right, so your attitude would be maintain rigorous graduation standards, but ultimately do a better job of educating kids well, within those standards. Let's look at it this way. Yeah. Let's say we reduce rigor right. so kids can graduate. So when they go to college, what are you going to do? Uh, more remediation yeah. so they can do college level work? Right. Where do you want this to take place? Right. Of course, the argument, uh, Mr. Secretary, is that not every kid is the same as every other kid and that you shouldn't mandate a one size fits all track to get out of high school. Um, the Secretary of Education, pardon me, the, uh, the Commissioner of Education for the state of Texas, Michael Williams, who you know, was concerned that in an effort to make it so that there's not a one size fits all track, you might be pushing African-American and Hispanic kids disproportionately into a career and tech track, which he's described as a dumping ground, and that well, maybe well, that would be an argument against revising it. But the one-size-fits-all argument seems reasonable, that not every kid's going to require the same thing. Well, I don't see a conflict between more rigor or having appropriate rigor, right. appropriate rigor, and having multiple tracks. Right. Even tracks that are not academic tracks still could be tracks that have the appropriate rigor for the kind of career that the child uh, seeks. Yeah. The, 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 the big thing here would be the guidance that's going to take place in helping the child make this kind of decision. Where, where, is, this going to, where is this support going to come from? Right. Let me give you an example. Before House Bill 5, Texas had three diplomas. I think it was the minimum diploma, the recommended diploma, and the, uh, I forgot, the exceptional, uh, distinguished. Pluma, okay? Uh, and uh, of course, if you look at the data very carefully, you find that there's been a shift in uh, moving children through these tracks. In fact, um, some years ago, maybe five or six years ago in one particular district I, I know about, about 11% of the students graduated with the minimum track, which was 22 credits. The distinguished was 26 credits. About 11% of the students from this particular district graduated with, uh, through the minimum track. A close examination of data showed that six or seven years later, close to 20%, or better than 20% of the students are graduating using the minimum track. Right. So what does this do? This elevates your percentage of students who are graduating. Right. So just the fact that they're, you're graduating more students, if you graduate them with less competence yeah. uh, and less career ready, 
I don't think you're making very much progress. You may those be letting those kids off the hook. Absolutely. Right. And if they decide to go to college, what you're doing is causing more costs involved in remediation at the college level. And one theory here, Mr. Secretary, is that low graduation rates are actually kind of like that, that alarm that goes off in your basement when the radon level is too high. It sort of yeah. it warns you we have a problem here, yes. right? Um, at the higher ed level, we at the Tribune recently looked at several hundred thousand kids who entered the eighth grade in Texas public schools and tracked them 11 years out, so six years after what would have been their high school graduation year, to see how many of them had some form of higher ed completion. We were somewhat alarmed to discover that of the 300,000 or so kids who went in, fewer than one in five actually achieved some kind of high school completion, and disproportionately the ones who did not achieve it were African American and Hispanic. The rates of completion in the non-white student populations were about half of the white student populations. In some ways those numbers are helpful because they tell you there's a problem without necessarily pointing to exactly what the solution is. Uh, I find it astonishing but it's a problem that we clearly need to, to work on. Right, that we're not working on adequately. Uh, you were the superintendent of the Houston uh, School District. We say then the nation's seventh largest. Houston is the fourth largest city today. I don't know if it's still the seventh largest. Yeah. It's but it's a very, very large and particularly extraordinarily diverse school district. From your experience as a superintendent, I wonder if you feel like people like us sitting up here and talking about this stuff in theory is all well and good but at the ground level, actually having to deal with these problems and dealing with a diverse student population with all the challenges is something else entirely, and that maybe people like us at the moment don't appreciate what it's like at that level. You know, I think you've described a little bit of how I feel. For example, uh, we, we need effective policy, and it's very helpful to have a effective policy. Yeah. But there is, I think in my view, a serious gap between policy and practice. And if the policy does not impact practice, then uh, it's of very little value. And I find that, that, that many of the people involved in developing policy are really hardworking, committed, and good people. They know the literature, they know the research, you know, they, 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 they understand the funding and, and, and they have real good intention. Yep. But that's somewhat of a blind spot when you don't actually see or understand or appreciate what actually goes on at the ground level, where the kids are and where right. the teachers and principals look into the eyes of the children. That's a whole different world. And these people need to have some impact and some involvement in, in developing the policy. Right. That's why I think this policy gap exists that we don't hear a lot of talk about. But I think you have to really search hard to find where policy has made a significant change in practice and consequently a significant change in um, the, the, the improvement of schooling. So it was useful for you actually to have come out of the Houston School District having been a superintendent? Well, in fact, uh, it was pretty clear that even as a U.S. Secretary of Education, I was a practitioner. Yeah. And there were a lot of good people who were elite policymakers. Yeah. And sometimes we went like that. So tell me how Arne Duncan is doing at that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to sit here and ask you repeatedly to tell me your opinion of how he's doing, and if you tell me you won't tell me, I'm going to ask well, you again in, and again. In, general, you in, in, in one general term, let's say this, uh, I, I, I like and appreciate Ernie Duncan. Yeah. I, I, I talk to him occasionally, um, and also uh, I appreciate Secretary Riley. This who, is Dick Riley. Dick Riley, who, who was there before you, I came, right, uh, who preceded in, me. In the Clinton administration. Right, and he gave me clean out of brief. And I'm going to give Secretary Duncan clean out a brief. I'm not going to impeach him. So if I ask you over and over, you're not going to actually I'm going to get the same answer. You, you, <laughs> grew, you grew up, I'm going to get off that immediately then. Um, you, you grew up, Mr. Secretary, in a segregate, in, at, at a time when segregation mm -hmm. kind of was the thing. You saw the issue of civil rights and of race and of educational opportunity or lack of opportunity and all that. What did your own personal experience growing up uh, teach you? What, what kind of perspective did it give you on this idea of education as a civil right? I grew up in, in Mississippi, and you can tell from my age and your knowledge of history of the United States that that was a very uncomfortable time for a young person like me in Mississippi at that time. Right. But I want to be clear, uh, Mississippi today is a, con a completely different state, and, and I'm proud of my home state of, of, of Mississippi. But uh, I grew up in, in very rigorous uh, 
a very rigorous society for an African-American uh, young man. And I, but Parents I was, were both professionals. But I, was, I was fortunate to have good, yeah. strong parents who shielded me from a lot of the meanness of our society through education. And so I grew up believing that although we had problems in the world, education was the solution to all of those problems. Right. So that's really what kind of guided me uh, in my thinking and in, 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 in how, how I approach life. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I can look back now at many of the kids who were my uh, uh, buddies during that period of time who, who have been less successful, uh, who in many cases were better athletes and in some cases better students, Yes. but, but didn't have the kind of parental support that I had and consequently were uh, less successful. Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Secretary, about a couple of, of broader issues in the realm of education policy and policy reform today that we can perhaps try to tie back to this notion of, of education as a civil right or education uh, within the non-white uh, population of students, which, as we say, is growing quite mm -hmm. significantly and is becoming more and more of a factor in, in the national conversation about education. Let me ask you about accountability and testing. So we alluded to, talked about No Child Left Behind mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. What if, if you could wave your wand over public ed right now, what would be the proper accountability system that you would have place? Would you go back to no, no Child Left Behind as it was imagined? Is there something else that would be more effective these days? Well, that's Help thing, us understand. There's some things about no child, no child Left Behind that I would do differently now. And, and, and I, I think the public needs to understand that uh, although this was the very first thing that President Bush uh, attempted to do, uh, when uh, uh, there were some things that disrupted the discussion Yes. Remember, uh, we had pretty productive discussion, a bipartisan discussion, until about the end of July. And so, the beginning of August, and guess what happens? The entire Congress goes out for a month break, a whole month vacation. They come back in September. Guess what happened in September? September 11th. 9/11. 9/11. Right. So then, there's no discussion about no child left behind now. 9/11 is going on. So we finally rally all the people back together after weeks and weeks of this and begin to work on the legislation again. And guess what happens? Somebody puts anthrax in the Senate office building. So now we can't even find the senators because they're all over the office all over the state, of, all over DC. And so I'm, 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 so, I'm, I'm so appreciative of those staffs who, who really worked hard and kept things going. So finally, uh, begin, begin Thanksgiving and just after Thanksgiving, we begin to get the uh, act in, in some type of way that we could approve and finally, agree on some language that we can take to the president he can sign. With clear, with the clear understanding that we needed some additional discussion about this act. But it should be understood that it was the beginning and it, that's how it was attempted. Yeah. We, we understood that there should be some improvement as things go by. And we had hoped that that would be in the reauthorization process, uh, maybe even amended somewhat, that we could yeah. continue to improve this particular act. Didn't happen though. Didn't happen. Right. You think it was politics that killed No Child Left Behind as opposed to the flaws in the act themselves? Well, I, I, I hesitate to call uh, any parts of the act flaws. I, I would say that there are some things that need to be improved and some things to be changed. But the question of did politics do <laughs> Of course, politics was a big. So, so tell us, t so revise the act while we're sitting here. Tell us what you would do differently. Well, uh, I think that, that probably the most important thing that I would do was would provide more support for teachers. I think uh, in the final analysis, teachers didn't quite believe that we could create an environment or create a situation where all kids be, would, would, would be brought up to grade level by 2014. They didn't see that possibility being real. And so, because they were not provided with the wherewithal, the resources. One of the reasons is that they were not provided with the kind of resources and the kinds of uh, support that could help them do right, that. Right. Right. So that would be the first place I would start in making changes. Right. Well, let me ask you about testing, which is obviously a big component of the accountability discussion. Again, just using Texas, mm -hmm. where we sit today, as a canvas, massive uh, effort to get the number of standardized tests reduced. Uh, in the last year. Parents and other people from across the political spectrum effectively marched on the Capitol in Austin with pitchforks and torches demanding yeah, saw that, yeah. that uh, we reduce the number of standardized tests. There had been 15 tests 
They would have been happy in some cases for there to be zero tests. Ultimately, the number that was settled on was five. So the number of standardized tests went down from 15 to five. Generally speaking, are you on the side of those who believe that we test too much and that we spend too much time preparing kids in school to take tests? Well, generally speaking, I would say that I would be one that would entertain a discussion about whether the 15 was too much. Right. But I would be one that would absolutely oppose the fact that five is the right number. You, so you would have actually seen I, the number be? I, I think it's, it would be much, much greater than five, but depending on how they were structured and what they yep. were for. Let me tell you the story. Sure. When, when I was, um, before I became the secretary, I, I went to a conference in San Francisco uh, about the achievement gap. And uh, there was a lot of discussion. And finally, uh, in the Q&A period, uh, a lady came to the back and said, I know how to close the achievement gap. Of course, that would be startling. Tell us, everybody wants to know how to close the achievement gap. And she said, we can close the achievement gap. All we gotta do is stop testing. <laughs> and so what that meant is create a blind spot so we don't see it, it doesn't exist. So if the, if the state has appropriate standards, if these are the right standards, you must know the extent to which students are achieving or not achieving those standards in order to make the appropriate corrections. And so that mix is what should be carefully studied, but I just have, uh, am of the opinion that the broad breast stroke that just knocked it from 15 to five was probably, probably ill-advised. Right. Right. You mentioned teachers, being able to give teachers the resources they need. Teachers are a big part of the conversation. Are we doing an adequate job of training teachers? Is teacher education right now where it ought to be? Uh, are we paying teachers enough? And, and, are, and are there special things that you should be thinking about in terms of teacher training and teacher recruitment to deal with the achievement gap specifically? The, the most important decision you're gonna make as a superintendent is it, it's your decision about uh, selecting teachers. Right. And uh, as superintendent, I was very concerned about that, as was some other superintendents that I, that I admired uh, in, this, in, in the state of Texas. And uh, there, are, there are many ways I think you can improve uh, the teaching profession. One of the things we'd like to see, and it may be something that can't quite be done, but some movement in that direction would be, I think, very helpful, is that to have more clinical experiences for teachers. Tell me what you mean by that. Well. Right now, we have teachers that do a very short period of what they call practice teaching. And I think that's very inadequate for a person who has not had much interface with that kind of environment. For example, in doctors uh, have a whole intern year where they are in the, in the hospital itself working. We may could have some type of system where some teachers- Some kind of residency some program. Some kind of residency for, where, te where teachers teach are actually in the classroom learning, yeah. actual practice, because just the theory of this practice right. is, I think, inadequate. Do, do, uh, let's talk about the African-American students who you wrote about in 2010 and the gap in, in achievement. Do <clears throat> we need black teachers to teach black kids? Do we need Hispanic teachers to teach Hispanic kids? Is part of the problem that we're not reaching down into some of these communities, African-American and Hispanic communities, to find teachers? Well, if you're specifically talking about do you need a Hispanic teacher to teach a student, a Hispanic student algebra two? Probably not. But do you need to have enough Hispanic people in the school system so that uh, it kind of represents uh, some goals that they uh, uh, model some of the environments that the students could see? Yes. I would say absolutely. Yeah. And one of the uh, problems that we have right now is uh, especially male teachers, especially ethnic male teachers, African-American male teachers, in many cases, Hispanic male teachers. Right. Uh, it, I think it's a serious problem. And so, yeah. so if you're an African-American male public school teacher coming out of school looking for a job, this is definitely a seller's market. Absolutely, if you're a good right. teacher. If you're, if, good teacher. If, if you're a good teacher. Let me ask you about Common Core. We talked a little bit about one size fits all uh, aspects of public education. There, I, I, if I understand right now, there are 45 states plus Washington, D.C. that have embraced Common Core. The holdouts are Texas, Virginia, Alaska, and Nebraska, and I believe Minnesota is kind of halvesies on this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, some states are now reconsidering that. Reconsidering it. Is this a good thing 
Is Common Core necessarily a good thing? I mean, you know, what we hear from a lot of the states is we don't want the federal government messing in our business. We don't want to be dictated anything from Washington back to the states. We believe in federalism or the Tenth Amendment or just leave us alone, what have you. So all of a sudden this rush to, is Common Core kind of run smack into the political environment in which much of the country exists? Okay, that's, that deserves a little explanation here. First place, uh, many years ago before they, st they talked about Common Core, President Clinton tried to have a national ap approach to it and invited certain superintendents from around the nation to come to Washington right. and be with him and discuss this. And I was one of those who went. So from the very beginning, I, I felt that 50 different state systems uh, need not have the total control over the, 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 the education of people in the United States of America. After all, remember 1983, the publication of A Nation at Risk? It didn't say 50 different states at risk. The nation has some risk uh, in our inadequate uh, performance. So then there has to be some national approach to this. Coordination. Whether, whether, coordination. Right. Whether the Common Core is the right one or not, we can discuss and debate that. But uh, 50 different moving parts, the system is already too complex. There are too many moving parts in it to, to make it work properly. And we can never be able to right. have an efficient system with that many points right. of authority. You understand that you talk about we need to have something come out of Washington and coordinate what's happening in 50 states. There are people in Texas who drive you to the state line for saying that. Yeah, but I need to make this clear. I think part of the problem at the Common Core now is the federal in, uh, involvement. The, the, and I, well, I would well, like but to, what I, part of Common am I not understanding? That's the point of the Common is the federal well, involvement. Well, Common should be understand volunteer. For example, uh, I think uh, that the Department of Education should not be are taking a position and pushing people towards the Common Core. I think that's one of the reasons that we're getting a lot of pushback on it. It should and be I, more of a helpful suggestion. Absolutely, and I'll use uh, uh, Petrelli's uh, statement about this. I think the federal government should butt out as far as Common Core is concerned. It just, Mr. Secretary, that just seems so weird to me. It's, it's like it's coming from the federal government, but then the federal but government it, should but butt it's, out? But it's not coming from the federal government. It comes from the 50 different states and it's the 50 different states coming together decided upon this, and those that want to join can. can. That's different from uh, the federal government coming out and incenting yeah. people to do this. So you're also not a big fan of Race for the Top? Uh, we've discussed Ernie Duncan before, so my answer right. is the same. <laughs> this, is, this is the part at which you say, I don't comment on my successor. Is that that's, what that's, that's or, the part, or yes. my later? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few more minutes of our conversation, then we're going to have questions in the audience, so begin to think about what you want to ask the secretary, and, and you can begin to line up here shortly. Let me ask you about charters and the question of parental choice, which has come up <clears throat> just in the last couple of weeks in Absolutely. Mayor de Blasio's New York City, where Mayor de Blasio seems to be taking a different position on charters than Mayor Bloomberg did. And this is not without controversy at a time when people, many people believe that charter schools could be one element of a solution for some of the things we're talking about. What do you think about that? I think there are two real irreversible forces that's gonna impact education today. One is technology. There's no backing up on this. This is gonna be with us, we need to Right. Use it and, and help to help us. The other one is choice. We're not gonna. We're, we're not gonna have. Uh, the nation is not gonna put up with non-choice. And I personally think that uh, pushing against things like charters uh, not for is, it. is not helpful at all. And right. In fact, it's very damaging to right. to to our system. But of course, Mr. Secretary, there's a continuum of choice. So there's let's let parents who have kids in failing public schools. Let's give them more freedom to remove their kid from a failing school in that district and put them in another school in that district. Then there is, let's expand the number of charter applications approved, say at the statewide level like in Texas. We can either have a higher ceiling or we can have an unlimited number. Then there is vouchers, which is another, uh, uh, another way that choice manifests itself more controversially than charters. Where do you fall along the continuum, accepting that you're for choice, generally speaking? Well, any system that promotes choice right. is what I think would be a benefit to, uh, to, our, to our, uh, our nation. Because 
we're so diverse. There's no one system that's going right. to do well for all of us. Right. And so that should be uh, uh, an environment where a person can choose the system right. that fits them best. That's how they'll invest in that system. It reduces conflict. You, you, if you got a group of people in one place uh, and one person complains about something, if you fix that, it may not fit the other person who's going to complain against it. So right. it reduces conflict. It's, uh, the, and, and further, it's a monopoly. And we all know monopolies don't work. So, so then you think from a, from a choice standpoint, you're comfortable with the idea of parents having more flexibility to pull their kids out of a failing school and put I them in I think it's a necessity. I okay. think it's a crime. I think it shouldn't be, if, you, if, if, if a parent has to send their child to a, a particular school that's failing, that's not putting the child in a place where there will be attention. Peace. That's putting the right. child in a place where there is detention. P peace. So then how about charter schools? There are a lot of concern that uh, there are charter applications that get put in and get approved, but that they're not actually, from an academic standard standpoint or a financial management standpoint, adequate to the task. How do you ensure that the charters we allow into the conversation and provide that choice are all performing at the at the right level. Of course, one of the advantages of charters is that uh, if they are chartered in a way that they can be, the charter can be revoked if they're not meeting right. the terms. So of the accountability. Charter, accountability. We like accountability. And in, in, many, in many cases, I think even in our own state, we, we've not done uh, a job uh, as well as we should in revoking the authority right. to operate in charter schools that right. That, that should that ferreting should not, out the bad actors has to happen. Absolutely. Right. But of course, when you get over to the end of the continuum, Mr. Secretary, where you talk about vouchers there, you know, very broadly uh, uh, said, you're talking about potentially migrating tax dollars out of the public education system and into parochial or private schools where some of those accountability measures may not correspondingly go. Yeah, it's so funny. Is that, is that okay? You're an accountability guy. Okay, yeah, but look, th this word vouchers sounds really bad, doesn't it? Because it's it just sounds vouchers. like a word to me. I don't know. So, so it's, it's, I think, part of, part of it. I'll give you an example. When I was superintendent of schools in Houston, uh, the southwest part of our city, uh, the population grew so rapidly that our schools were very crowded over there. Right. The fire department was limited to the number of kids that could go into the school building. In fact, they were giving our principals tickets because they enrolled too many students in that particular building and they saw it as a fire hazard. So then we couldn't have space for these kids. So I had two choices. One choice was that I could put these kids on a bus and drive them 45 minutes across town where there were vacant places where they could go into these schools. Yep. Which would add 45 minutes to the travel time for the kids. Each way. Each way, which would interrupt the schedule that parents had each way. Uh, and it, it was all kinds of decisions like that. Uh, the other decision was in the, in the southwest part of our city, there were about four or five perfectly great private schools having the same kind of certification we had from the TEA. Right. I could provide opportunity for these children to go to these private schools if they chose to do this. And so I convinced the board to allow me to do this. And of course, I got blamed for backdoor vouchers and that kind of thing. But what I saw it as solving a problem. Uh, part of my biggest problems with uh, during that period of time was my transportation system. I had 1,300 buses moving every morning with about 50,000 children on it, right. back to school and back to school and back home. And almost every day, we had a problem with the transportation systems. I wasn't interested in in, in expanding the transportation creating system, creating more big, problems, creating right. more problems. Right. So th that created many problems, and some of the kids were satisfied with those schools that were already authorized to be good schools by the TEA. So yeah. then I don't see it as, as uh, the, the flames that this term voucher has. I saw it as solving a problem. Good, okay. Well, we're gonna stop, we could keep going. We'll stop our conversation here. We'll bring people in the audience into the conversation. I am nearly blind. And so I'm gonna just, assume, thank you. Look at that, if only life actually worked like that, it'd be great, just lights <laughs> magically appear. Um, and we'll try, I guess we have one microphone, right? Just one. So um, I don't have to go back and forth. So we'll go as long as our time permits. We have about 18 minutes. Go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, my name is Joey Wood, and I am a public school teacher from Michigan. Um, many of my colleagues have always said that the goal of No Child Left Behind was a good one, 100% proficiency. 
but the way we assess proficiency left something to be desired. In your uh, travels around the country, have you seen other forms of assessment beyond multiple choice tests that we could use to help bridge this gap between the goal of No Child Left Behind and the results that we've seen? Right, so they yes. agree, on, agree on the goal, but it's about executing on yeah, the goal. It's a, it's a good, it's a two points here. The first place is remember how proficiency is defined and managed was a state function. The federal government did not mandate what, if, what they meant by proficiency. States could do that. So uh, it is not correct to say that that was a, a federal, federal issue. But how, are there other systems? Of course there are. Uh, but there are none that can be as efficient as standardized testing for the number of students that you would have in your state or in other states. Because of the large number of students that we have, it would be extremely expensive and probably impractical uh, in using other methods. If you could come find a method that is less expensive and, less, and more practical, I don't think there would be any objections to that. We just want to make sure that this, the situation is assessed. And so if different states wanted to develop different systems of executing upon that requirement of proficiency, each, that each, would be okay. Each state had a plan that they sent right. to the federal government that we approved. Have you seen a system that you thought was a good one? I have not seen a system that I thought was a good one that would, could take care of the number of children in, that would have in, to be in tested. In place of. In place of. Right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yes. Uh, hello, Dr. Page. My name is Daniel Fountainberry, and uh, my company is one of the startups that are participating in the startup competition here. Um, you mentioned that there are two forces you said were going to change education, technology and choice. So for those of us who are in the room who are thinking about ways of using technology to solve some of these persistent challenges like closing the black-brown achievement gap, what more do you want to see from the technology community? Where do you see as the area of space that we could be focusing on to drive real change and real progress? Great question. I, I think that the, probably the best place to do, begin would be in uh, providing teachers uh, with the resources and, and knowledges about the available technology. To so the tools. tools. Tools that they can use. Uh, it's one of the failings that we have now in our system. M many teachers simply are, are not learned in, in the technology and, and not aware of the availability of how they can use this technology to, so to solve problems. It didn't just begin, it's always been like that. When I became superintendent of schools in Houston, and it was unlike other, uh, 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 true in other school districts as well, we saw computers sitting on people's desks like trophies, and they weren't using them. So the potential for their use and teachers being trained how to use them effectively is our big issue. Do you worry that the access to resources will hurt communities that have a lower economic advantage? So if you rely on technology, that's gonna come at an expense. Someone's gonna to have to bear that expense. Do the African-American and Hispanic communities relative to the white community have a enough access, adequate access, to embrace those technological tools as a solution here? Well, I think it's a disadvantage if you are in low income and, and, and not only that, but in everything. Right. It's, it's, it's a situation, this is a real situation that we live in. So who should well, bear the responsibility for providing those tools so that we don't create yet another gap? Well, uh, I think our constitution said that we need to have an efficient school system. And so I don't think you can be efficient unless you have advanced technology. So iPads for everybody? Well, not necessarily. iPads for everybody. In, in a lot of school systems, we have iPads, but they don't have the, the programs to, in the, to use the iPads properly. So that would be not a good and idea. And that gets back to the training you were That's talking right. about mm -hmm. in teachers. Yes. Hi, my name is Clara, and I'm helping manage a program that used to belong to the U.S. Department of Education called TEACH. And, you know, part of the campaign is to change the public perception of what it's like to be a teacher and to make more out of their careers through the profession as a teacher. Um, so one of the main aims of the campaign is to close the achievement gap specifically in the teacher workforce, um, really targeting exceptional Latino and black students to consider professions in teaching. Mm -hmm. 
Um, at the same time, during this recruitment process, one of the biggest struggles is also the huge debt that students get from going into higher, ed higher education, okay. especially those that graduate from very expensive colleges. And so when we ask these these students to go into professions and teaching, we're also asking them to carry a significant Adam, financial yes. burden let me, on their backs. Let me ask you to ask your question if you don't mind. So yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I think I got the question. The, 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 part of the problem, I think, is um, you asking students to choose a career to be a teacher and to commit themselves to teaching the rest of their lives. That may be the wrong approach. Maybe a better approach would be like Teach for America does. And let's say we're gonna have you uh, teach for a spe specific period of time, and they have just hordes of people coming to them. Yeah. For teach. Matter of fact, they had thousands and thousands of people competing to go into the classroom. So maybe some thought, some, some rethinking and using those kinds of thought might help, be helpful. And is the idea that it would be in exchange for forgiveness of some of this debt? Yeah, so my, my question is really aimed at the debt that students right. carry with them because teaching isn't the most lucrative career out can, there. Can that, be, can that be a way to give an incentive to more kids to go into it teaching? Might, it by, might be. I think they've tried that in some states. Is Georgia a state like that? Forgiveness of debt. Yes. Mm -hmm. do, do, we, do we denigrate the teaching profession too much in this country? It feels like the conversation Absolute, we have, absolutely we, we blame do. teachers, it seems like, for everything to the point that you could be forgiven for wondering why kids would want to go into this. It's almost as bad as we denigrate politics, right? You know, who would want to go, in, who would want to go into a profession that people s talk so negatively about? Absolutely. Right? I, I, that doesn't need an expansion. You're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Page. Uh, my name is Ben Boddy. I don't know if you remember, but I uh, discussed our film, Education, um, previously when I was working at the Senate Education Committee. Um, my question to you is, what are we going to do about the current education system and helping foster the creative and innovations that we need to have an innovative system? Um, currently, with the student debt crisis, just like um, the previous question, we have a system that's currently not as efficient as it is because students at the end game are now being saddled with a lot of debt. I've been in contact with a lot of the large cha charter management organizations and a lot of the statistics on students that are coming out of charter schools currently are pretty dismal in terms of right. getting job traction in the job market. So you're, a you're asking what do we do to encourage innovation and creativity in public education? Inefficiency. Just in inefficiency. Creative. What about that? Well, there are several uh, entities that's been trying that and they've been running against a brick wall because trying to increase productivity and to have measures that measure the amount of efficiency that school districts have. And that's been a big, big problem that I don't have the answer for. I do realize that it's something that's important that we should seek, but so far right now, uh, it has not been able to catch, catch fire. All right, thank you for your question. Ma'am? Yeah, good evening. My, uh, my name is Tatiana Polatko and I'm a founder of a college prep organization called Teen Sharp that works in the greater Philadelphia area. I have a question regarding some of the mentions around parental involvement that we had. I have a big problem with the implicit or explicit notions that low-income parents are somehow not involved or not supportive. I think much has to do with how we define that support and if it means being a soccer mom, or volunteering in the library, then sure, hourly parents, parents who work hourly jobs or not professional jobs do not have those opportunities. But if we think about education, about support being caring and talking to children in part, in, about importance of education, we have no evidence to assert and that low-income parents are not supportive. And to the contrary, the kind of lengths they often have to go to to find good opportunities for kids yep. suggests that they are very much involved, more involved than some of their upper income parents. So my question is, um, can we do away with this narrative and actually move to actions, you know, not use it as a cop-out and take some steps that would allow our low-income children to have equitable opportunities in education? What's, what's keeping us from actually uh, ending all the talk and actually doing something? Well, I think that, that this is just a part of our system that we are regarding as not as important as it should be regarded. From my point of view, it's, it's kind of like a three-leg stool. The school, the home, 
and the community. And right now we're doing all we can to improve what goes on in the school and very little about what to improve about what goes on in the home and what goes on in the community. And so that should be more programs that provide support for parents. And I think that, that there's no, uh, use, no useful way that we can use a big comprehensive term that low income parents, I, I don't, uh, low income parents are as encouraged and interested in their children as other parents are. Right. But I come, back to, I come back to this question of what the institution of public education as a practical matter can do to change parent behavior because it's not the responsibility of public ed to muck with parents. Well, it may not be public ed that has to do that, but there has to be some so who, system so of government. So who should do it? Well, uh, as a community, we should figure out a way to do it. I don't know if we should embed that support in the schools or we should embed that support in, in other parts of our institutions or what we should where we should do it. But we have a problem, and that problem is many parents need help and support in how to be good parents. Right. And we need to find ways to support them. Whether, and, and, I, and I think the schools are already embedded with enough challenges. We need support from other places. Okay. Ma'am. Hi. My name is Mitzi Moore. I've been a teacher in Texas for 26 years, and I will say I'm a much better teacher now than I was in year two, um, but that's not the issue. I heard a speaker once say that no child left behind was the high water mark of the civil rights movement. And he said this because shining a light on what you describe as the achievement gap uh, helps us as in the classroom change our practice to be more fair and to be more effective with all types of people. And publishing those results by subpopulation does give us tools and information that we did not have before. However, I've also seen as a member in my community that publishing the results by individual school just serves to reinforce the prejudices that we already have about that side of town and that school. So in your opinion, yeah. has it helped or has it harmed? I'm not sure I, that could be an emphatic, concrete response to has it helped or has it harmed. I'm not sure I could have th that information to make a, a specific claim there. But I will say that we, we need to be able to know the extent to which children are achieving the standards that the state says should be achieved by those students. To not do that would mean that we would have to be making decisions in the blind, not knowing where the child stands in terms of the standards that the state sets. So it's all in the state setting appropriate standards. And once you, standards are of no value whatsoever, unless you have some type of assessment system to determine the extent to which those standards are being achieved or not achieved. Now, once you determine that, you are suggesting that we should keep that a secret and it shouldn't be provided to the public. That's a discussion that we can have. I'm not sure I could take a position on that yet. Well, I'll take a position on it. I wonder what the point of having an accountability that's system that's is right. where people in the community don't get to know the information. that their school's not working. I mean, it seems to me that the, the, you have to weigh, of course, what the questioner's asking, which is that you're reinforcing stereotypes, but the reality is, how do you fix something if you don't know that it's broken? Yeah, and also, but we want to be careful to say we don't want to, the school is not the only thing that's not working if the child is not achieving. But let's assume that the, that the, the, the fact that the school is not achieving tells you that you have 10 other things to fix that are not the school. You mm -hmm. at least need to know that. Well, I agree with that. Yeah, I'll take that. Mr. Secretary, my name is Harold Jackson. I teach, I'm an administrator in Pine Tree Independent School District in Longview, Texas. Um, yesterday I attended a workshop on uh, saving black kids or black, saving black boys and brown boys. Um, I, I rushed over to get in because I didn't want to get, you know, standing room only. And when I got inside, it was just, it's like a ghost town. You know, it's, there were, there, if it's a priority, what do we need to do to sound the alarm regarding, uh, children of color, black boys and Hispanic boys. What do we need to do, in your opinion? I wish I had the answer to that. That's what I wrestled with when I wrote the book, The Black White Achievement Gap, by closing it as the greatest civil rights issue of our time. And what I was really saying was that uh, for our civil rights institutions, those entities that claim to be moving us towards civil rights, that there is no strategy 
available that has a higher leverage opportunity to change the ethnic uh, equality issue than closing the achievement gap, than education. And what I made the point in the book is that I felt that the leadership in these communities, whether it's in the Hispanic community or the African American community, has to own this issue, has to accept this as a, as, as a issue that is worth working on in order to achieve a civil rights, that you cannot achieve full civil rights without making sure that our children have the greatest opportunity to, to educate themselves. So our leadership has to own this. And so what can we do? We can put more pressure on our leadership and try to insist that they take this on as an issue. We have time for one more question. We have one more questioner. It's nice when that works out so well. <laughs> Perfect. So go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, President Obama right now is promoting, uh, uh, to some extent, a two-year uh, law school system, uh, arguing that the three-year system is inefficient. Uh, considering the student loan debt crisis, do you think that part of the answer to the overall cost of higher education lies in considering uh, reducing the four-year systems and uh, reducing number of years to uh, make, make the system more efficient and uh, lower the amount of debt one has to carry. Of course, at the same time, Mr. Secretary, it seems like the four-year graduation rate is becoming more outmoded with each passing year, and now it's almost like six years is what it takes to get out I, in some places. I don't know if I can be specific in terms of answering that question. Let me say about, because uh, I, I don't know a lot about the high school curriculum, I mean about the law curriculum. I, I know about the high school curriculum, and I can say this. The senior year in high school is a wasted year. There could be much more efficiency. Uh, and right. it, Secretary Riley took this on as an issue uh, in the Clinton administration. And I participated in a lot of the workshops that he had to improve the efficiency in the senior year because of a lot of non-learning activity takes place there and there's a lot of space that, that we can do other Would things. Would you dump the 12th grade? I mean, I guess that's been a topic of conversation that some people have had. It needs to be restructured. I wouldn't go as far as to say dump, but it certainly needs to be restructured. As far as the law school is concerned, I'm not sure that I could take a position on that, but I can say this, though. I'm aware of the fact that there are certain, and it's beginning to pick up momentum, schools now that are coming online that are, are much more efficient than some of the schools that we have now in terms of the, of the four-year curriculum and reducing the amount of time that students are uh, engaged in order to accomplish their career goals. So that whole thing deserves discussion. I'm not sure where it should come out, but it needs to be investigated. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have landed the plane safely. <laughs> I want to ask you to join me in giving a hand to Secretary Page for his uh, time and being here. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We'll see you again. Thank you.